It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Randy White and Mark Streed. Hello folks, welcome to Board Game Corner. I'm Mark and I'm Randy. This week we're battling angels, the dark and the light. We're using scripts and pillars to defend and attack. The name of the game is Regnum Angelica. It was, it's a game that was successfully kickstarted earlier this year under the name Kingdom. It's a game for two players, 16 years or older, and it plays in about 45 minutes. Yeah, and it's somewhat reminiscent of chess. So let's take a closer look at how this game plays. Right. In Regnum Angelica, each player receives a deck of cards. The card decks are identical in terms of their power and functionality. The only difference is that one deck portrays light angels and the other one portrays fallen angels. There are three types of cards in this deck. The first one is the angel cards themselves, and these are the ones with which you'll be doing battle. The cards show the name of the angel at the top with a little bit of flavor text underneath. Then over on the left-hand side in the upper corner, you'll see the rank of the angel, and that's the score that will be obtained if you get this angel through the enemy gates. Beneath that is a number showing how many uh, squares the angel can move on the board. Then beneath the picture of the angel, you'll see a matrix of elements. And these elements determine how the angel attacks and defends when they go into combat. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the details of combat. The next type of card is called a pillar card. And this can be played on your angels to create a kind of defense or shield. This is only applicable when the angel is defending, but it can also be used to score an additional point if you get an angel with a pillar on it through the gates of the enemy. The last kind of card is called a script, or angelic script, and it's most similar to a instant if you've ever played Magic the Gathering. It can be played at any time by either player uh, at the cost of some of their power. Now this can be used to buff some of your angels or damage your opponent's angels or your opponent himself. All right, let's take a close look at the board. You have your scoring track, and in, in a typical game, you're scoring to 35. And then you have your power meter. And your power meter is used for scripts and things, and we'll get to that in a bit. And then on the board, you have your uh, kingdom, the gates of the kingdom. Um, and this is where your opponent will move in to score. Right, this is basically the goalpost of the game. Exactly. And then your first track on the board is where your, your angels will start out. And they start out inactive uh, when you first place them. And then from there, they move through the board to the Earth Zone. And in the Earth Zone, there's some neat things you can do. The Roman numerals uh, allow you to in, in basically advance your power meter. And then the, the middle one with the card allows you to draw a card on your turn. Let's walk through a typical turn. Regnum Angelica provides a convenient reference card that shows the six steps in a typical turn. It also shows a wheel at the top that illustrates how each element dominates another in the same fashion as rock, paper, scissors do. There is no lizard Spock in this game, though. <laughs> Step one is drawing movement cubes. And you draw a number of these little red movement cubes based on the number you have in your power track. So right now my power track's at three, so I would draw three movement cubes. However, even if your power track is at zero, you still draw at least one cube, so you're not paralyzed. The next step is to play an angel, and this is an option, but if you have an angel in your hand that you would like to play and you don't yet have five angels on the board, you can play an angel. It has to be played face down, indicating it's inactive. It has to be played someplace on the first row. If there is no space on the first row, you cannot play an angel. The third step is activating an angel from a previous turn. If you do have angels that are face down that have been played previously, now this can't be applied to the one you just played, but you can activate that angel and the effect, if there is an effect underneath the angel's picture, that effect activates when you turn it over. Now, you may choose to defer activating an angel because uh, that effect may be something you want to do at an opportune time. So it's possible and allowed to skip over activating the angels on the third step. Yeah, and it's important to note that some of those activations are constant mm -hmm. as well as a one shot. They That's true. activate and do one thing right when they, when they activate. Absolutely. So. The fourth step in a turn is movement. Now, movement can involve simply moving your angel downfield, potentially to one of those spots that have a reward on them, or it can involve combat. That's up to you. The first thing we do in the movement phase is allocate these little red movement cubes. The limit you can put on any particular angel is determined by the movement limit shown in the upper left-hand corner. There are a few exceptions to that, but in general, that's true. Yeah. Now, for each a movement cube on the angel, you're able to move one space. In the game, you can move horizontally, vertically, but also diagonally. So in the case of this angel, he has a limit of two moves. He could move up and over to get uh, a reward of two more, uh, two more power 
in his PowerPoints in his power track. Mm -hmm. He could move over and up if for some reason he wanted to only get one PowerPoint. He could move up and over to get to draw a card. Or if he just wanted to move his angel downfield, he could move up twice. Now, it's important to remember that the rewards on the zone of Earth only activate once per angel, and they only activate if the angel ends his turn on that square. Also, when you move, you have the option to attack. That's right. Let's go back to the angel with the two movement cubes on him. In addition to moving the spaces I showed you previously, he can move forward one and move diagonally to attack the light angel there. Now, when he attacks, the element he's using to attack is determined by the element in the direction that he's moving. So in this case, he's moving up and to the right, and the element in the upper right-hand corner of his matrix is fire. And in my case, defending, I'm using a pillar, which is earth. Earth uh, against fire loses. So I would lose my pillar and it would move to the void. Now, if I didn't have a pillar, um, again, my angel would be defending with earth, which would cause him to lose and move to the void. All right, let's take another look at this combat, but using scripts instead this time. My angel with the two movement cubes on him moves forward and moves to the upper right like he did previously to attack. He, again, he's attacking with fire, and in this case, there is no pillar on the light angel. He is attacking with fire, and the white angel is defending with earth. So I am not going to settle for that. So I'm going to use shift, which shift allows me to swap um, two angels or any angels that I have on the board with each other. So I'm going to swap these two, which then puts water as my uh, defense attack, so to say. And in this case, since I'm attacking with fire and he's defending with water, since water beats fire, I would lose my angel unless yes. I do something. What I can do is play a script called Annul for two of my power points. If I do that, I pay as soon as I announce this. Whenever you play a script, you pay up upon announcement. And then it, the uh, scripts are resolved in reverse order. So I want to counter his shift script. And for those of you who have played Magic the Gathering, you're familiar with counter spells. A null does just that. So I would play that on top of his shift and hope to annul his, uh, his shift script. Yeah, and I'm still not happy with that. So I'm going to use the exact same card, a null, to annul his annul and play on top. Now, obviously, I can only do this if I have enough power to do so. So in this case, it would cost me three total in power. Now, when these scripts resolve in reverse order, he basically counters my counter. He annuls my null. And this leaves his initial shift to be active. That allows the swap between his two angels to be effective. And in the end, because he's defending with water against my fire attack, I will lose my angel and it will go to the void. Yes, and I win. <laughs> <laughs> you win the battle, not necessarily oh, the war. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> okay, so after you've completed all your moves and resolved all your combat, then you have the option to burn pillars or scripts. This then will allow you to move your power meter up. And once you do, these move to your void. And it's important to note that, you know, if you're low on power, it, you really should do that even though you hate to lose some of those cards. Mm -hmm. And then, in this instance, let's say I have no cards in my hand, so I would draw up to four. You must have a minimum of four cards. Mm -hmm. And if you already do have four or more, then you draw one card. And then at the end of your turn, you discard all your movement cubes to their pile. That's right. Okay, so what did I think of this game? So in high school, I was a chess nerd, so I definitely find the appeal in this game. And even though there's a, a luck factor, which, you know, I suspect some chess, hardcore chess people won't like, um, I still find this a nice variant because uh, I really don't want to... I'd rather play this than go play chess anymore. So is where I'm coming from. Uh, the things I like a lot is the components, the pieces are really nice. Are. The cards, the artwork is nice. Um, those are just really well done. I, I do feel that, uh, I think you feel the same, that some of the text is a little too hard to read Way on the cards. Way too small, yeah. And it's not always the case, but the flavor text is consistently too yeah, small. Exactly. And it's not just because I'm old, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes the the uh, activation powers underneath the picture get a little bit small. small and, and, and almost fragmented because it's longer text right. to some degree. And it's hard enough for you as a player to read it sometimes, let alone read it on the other side of the board. So Exactly. But overall, you know, I, I, I like the artwork. I like the board. I 
love the power track. That's something that keeps me coming back yeah. for sure. Yeah. That draws me in. I'm like, oh, if I only had one more point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the game mechanics, I think, are very fascinating in the sense that you have a number of things to balance. And as Mark said, uh, the there's a fair amount of luck that could influence um, the outcome of the game. Very I don't think it's a luck-driven game by any means, but the person coming from a chess background might say, wow, that's it's not deterministic. I can't look at the board <laughs> exactly. and figure out everything that the other pay, player could possibly do. do. Yep. Now, he's got cards in his hands, and, and that could lead to a variety of outcomes. Yep. Now, Mark mentioned he played quite a bit of chess when he was in high school, and I played a bit when I was younger as well. What I've played more of is Magic the Gathering. Ah, uh, yes. And it's inevitable that this game will be compared to those two. Oh, yeah, which yeah. is really an interesting combo. It is, very so. much so. Uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, though, because I think that establishes the boundary of the space mm. where this game lives. Mm -hmm. uh, Mark mentioned the people who are hardcore chess players might not uh, like the the variety and randomness that yeah. kicks in there. But for people who've been playing chess and want a little bit more variety there, uh, some unexpected things, this fits the bill. Yep. Likewise, uh, people who like Magic the Gathering and who can tolerate this expense of buying more boosters all the time <laughs> and who enjoy the uh, the different powers in their card. So, you know, in, in Magic the Gathering, every color right. has their unique characters unique. and unique powers. And that's that are... something that could be really nice for this game. You know, I understand the bit that, it, you know, it's like chess where everyone has equal footing and it's just uh, see how each side handles those powers. However, part of me kind of wants to see the dark and light have different powers. It would be nice. And yeah. I think the people who like that in Magic the Gathering will probably miss that when they play the game. But people who want, who enjoy Magic, who want maybe a little bit uh, more straightforward game, a game that doesn't require you to keep bu buying boosters all the mm, time, and a game yes. that's easier to teach, I think uh, Regnum Angelica will fit oh, that yeah, bill. for sure. Uh, because you can have people visit for Thanksgiving, for example, and sit down and explain this fairly quickly. Now, oh. it's not simple to teach, but I don't think it's anywhere near as difficult as magic is. Yeah, and it's also interesting, we should note that there are lots of card combos with scripts and things there are. that even we have probably not discovered yet. So I think there's a lot of really fun combos that can happen. And and that's a key point because when you're playing this game, it's not a long game unless you play it that way. Right. Uh, you can certainly, it, it is prone to a bit of analysis paralysis. Yeah, a little bit. And you could um, take some strategies that would force your opponent into a corner and mm -hmm. just. Make it, make it very difficult for them. Or, <laughs> yeah, you could do that. So it could be a long game. But in general, I think it's a fairly quick game. And the reason I emphasize this is this. Mark mentioned the cool combos uh, yeah. that can come out from the cards. It's important to recognize that you need to appreciate them, whether they're happening to you, or that you're doing them, or they're happening <laughs> to, to you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> because we saw that on both <laughs> Many sides. Many times. Yeah, and you yeah. can suddenly, wow, there's 20 points. And so keep in mind that the game will end quickly, and next game will come up, and maybe you'll have a chance to do something equally as powerful. Exactly. Okay, some final thoughts and our rating. So being that my background is a bit of a chess nerd, I definitely enjoy this game. Um, the one thing that, you know, hardcore chess people may not like is that randomness again. But to me, I actually, I really like that. Um, I think it just adds a new dimension to the game, some nice strategy. Uh, I like the components, the artwork, it's all great. So I'm going to give it a solid three out of four corners. Now, my raw numbers weren't quite as high as Mark's, but they still rounded comfortably to a three corners out of four as well. Uh, I'm confident in giving it that score because I think it hits that sweet spot for people looking for a two-player game with, mm. with a significant amount of strategic element to it, yeah. as well as some variety. Now, um, I still play Magic. I don't play it as often as I'd like because it's hard finding other players. And when I do, I typically play it on a PC because I don't want to invest all afternoon in going to right. a tournament. <laughs> However, if I were looking for a two-player game to play with another human being face-to-face, -face, this is certainly a game I'd, I'd quickly turn to because I think it is, again, easy to mm. teach, uh, fairly easy, and uh, would be something that both parties would enjoy. If we enjoy a chess slash magic type game. Yep. Now, if I had any concern, it would be the fact that as Mark and I played, yeah. we're kind of pushing some of the envelope yeah, the rules we were, yeah. and hit some points of ambiguity. However, the publisher was great. They responded to any questions we had in yes. uh, timely fashion, um, and it was all to our satisfaction. Exactly. Think, yeah. So if you're playing this game and have questions, we encourage you to do so as well. Yep. And the game is available on their website, so you should go check it out. So that's our review this week. Hope you've enjoyed it. And until next time, folks. We'll see, see you at, at the, the table. table. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. 
You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com. <laughs>